Good morning to you all. Good to see you. Uh, you. You woke up and you got here. Now, I want you to know I came rolling in about three minutes ago. I saw some of you rolling in here like, listen, I get it, but you made it on Daylight Savings Day to church. That's awesome. Way to go. You're the champ. You're the G-O-A-T. All right. Come on. All right. Hey, we're starting a brand new series today called Fears and Dreams, and the reason is this, that I think everybody's got some fears of something in their life, but at the same time, I think God puts a dream in everybody's life, like he puts a plan, like a, something for us, and he plants that in, inside our hearts, and what I know about my own life, and it's probably true for your life too, is this, that whatever the dream is that God has for you, when fear attacks you, it will try to stop you from pursuing the dream that you have. Has anybody ever experienced that? Can you relate to that? And uh, so I, I want to just tackle that head on. The way to attack fear is to just step right up to it, punch it in the face and the throat, and then keep walking forward. Come on. And you don't back up on fear. You just go, no, I'm called to go this way. And so we're just going to dive into that. And I've got a song uh, that we're going to play for you to open up for my message today. It's my, the title of this particular message is Carry On at the Crossroads. Let's rock this, please. Carry on my yes! Be Come on, say it loud if you know it. Lay your weary head to rest. Don't you cry no more. Come on, all right, that's enough. All right. I don't want you to see what I do in my personal space, but that's <laughs> the beginnings. Here's, we're going to look at the story of Abraham because Abraham's called the father of our faith, and uh, we can learn from Abraham's story. It's in the Bible. It's in Genesis, and it's kind of the beginnings, really, of the, of the Jewish faith, and, and Jesus is actually born into the, the lineage of, of uh, Abraham's family, and so it's a great story, and I want you to start with me in Genesis chapter 15 with this verse where God's speaking to Abraham. He's kind of, got, Abraham's got a little life under his belt, and God says this, Let the, uh, the Lord told him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. Now, I want you to see something here. It's real simple. God takes people out of this land and goes, I'm going to give you this land. And listen, some of you, God has taken you out of some things so he can put you into some other good things, right? Like he goes, when he looks at your life, he goes, I am God over your life. And I took you out of here to put you over here. And that's how God is so good. He wants to actually get us out of the things that have been a place of pain and places of addiction and bondage and all of that. And, and God goes, I do not leave you the same way. I called you out of here and I got you here. That's just a great message right there. That's just a good sermon altogether. Anytime God puts a dream or a direction inside your heart, you're going to be faced with whether to continue or whether you want to quit at every single crossroads in your life. Because God will give you a dream, and you're going to be walking down the journey of your life. And the choice you have amidst all the other choices is, am I going to keep going in the direction God called me? Or am I going to quit and end up not going after all that God has for me? That's the choice that we all face. We all have uh, different fears. I have fears growing up. Is anybody in here like me? I was scared of the dark. Is anybody, that was your thing? You're scared of the dark? Some of you are scared to raise your hand. Some, uh, some of your, your, your phobia is church. And, uh, but man, I had a nightlight till I was 30, and I'm not lying. In the first service, Abby hears that, and she's like, Dad. And then I was over at Pasco, and Austin's on the front row over there, and he goes, Dad. And I'm like, I know, I hid this from my children. We all have our own fears. I got married, and it wasn't a nightlight. We just kept the light on in the other room. And Lisa's like, why? I don't know. I made something up. But, yeah, but Lisa, Lisa has her own fears. So like last Wednesday and Thursday, I'm just going to talk about Lisa for a second. She, she's complaining. She's like, I, got a, I, got, I think I got a toothache. Like it hurts. And how many of you have a fear of the dentist? Yeah, so my wife likes you. Uh, and so I said, babe, you should go get it checked out. She's like, no, no, it probably is going to go away. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. And so then we, on Friday, we had this beautiful, like, little romantic moment. First thing in the morning, Abby's off to school. I'm reading my Bible. She's sitting there, and she's working on something, listening to a sermon. It's never like that, but it was this morning, you know, like, where we're both, like, having the devotions at the same time. And Kenobi's there. Kenobi's just worshiping Jesus. I don't know what Kenobi's doing. 
And uh, Lisa goes, man, my tooth is still hurting. And I said, babe, call the dentist and just see if you can get in. And she's like, no. And I'm like, why not? You should do that. And she goes, I, I don't want to. And I said, well, but you don't want to do it if it gets worse tomorrow, Saturday, or Sunday. Then it's like emergency surgery. Surgery, you know. And like, well, you know, you don't want to have to go in. Go in today. So she, she calls and she says, hi. They said, hi, is this Lisa? Yeah, this is Lisa. Um, I have a toothache. And they said, hey, we could get you in at 1230 today. And she's like, okay, okay, I'll go. Thank you. And so she hangs up. And I'm like, way to go, babe. About two minutes, literally two minutes later, Lisa gets up, goes into our hallway bathroom, shuts the door. I can hear her. And the phone is ringing. And she's like, hi, this is Lisa. I just called. I want to cancel. <laughs> that is literally what happened. So she's all drugged up on Advil right now. But anyway, I don't know. Listen, some of you got a phobia. I don't know what it is. It might be spiders. It might be the dark. It might be small spaces. But I don't, I'm not trying to talk about that today. I want to talk to you really about the, the kind of fears that will stop you from pursuing what God has for you. That's what I want to address today. It's kind of a big picture thing. When we look at the life of Abraham, he's such a great example of this because he's the father of our faith. Now, as I dive into this, some of you may not know the story, so let me just set this up for you. In the beginning of the Bible, the first historical book is called Genesis, and one of the main characters is Abraham. Abraham has two different names because his given name when he was born is Abram. That's what his dad named him. But Abram later gets his name changed by God to Abraham, and it had a significant meaning and all that. But for the point of where we're going today, you just need to know that if you see the word Abram, it's the same guy as Abraham. And so that's his story. He grows up in the Middle East thousands of years ago and becomes a legend in faith because of his journey. Now, you need to also know this, a couple highlights about Abraham. Abraham's life is marked by crossroads. Like if you read through his story, it's amazing how you see the journey of Abraham's life at different places that he travels because he traveled a lot. A lot of crossroads, a lot of cities, a lot of decisions and challenges. For instance, him and Lot, his cousin, they're traveling to the promised land and they get there and there's not enough space. And so literally Abraham says to Lot, choose which way you're going to go and I'll go the other direction so we have enough space. That kind of thing's happening in Abraham's life all the time, choices, decisions, and all of that. And God gave him a dream of a place for his family. What's interesting is when God calls Abraham, what God asks of him is he says, I want you to go in this direction, and I want you to leave this land, and I want you to leave your family. And it's interesting that God asks of him something, and anytime God calls us, he's always going to ask for something. But what's great is that what God later on promises him is he says, I'm going to give you land and I'm going to give you a huge family. Right. Come on, God is so good that he'll never ask of you something that he couldn't absolutely repay. Right. Jesus even said these words. Jesus said, whoever gives up this or that or this for me, not only are you going to get a benefit in the life to come, you're going to be blessed now for that. Like God honors sacrifice when we obey him. Anyway, this is the story of Abraham, and there's three cities that you need to know, and there, I got them here on, oh, wow, there, this city's way over here. Let me move this over a little closer. So this is the first city. It's called Ur. I believe it's called Ur because it's so, at the beginning of the history of mankind, that they were like, hey, we should name this place, and they're like, Ur, you know, like, they couldn't think of anything. <laughs> That's good Bible humor. Thank you. Uh, can you all see this? It's kind of bent. I can't bend it. It's, some musician was angry and they, you know, okay. So it's Haran. Can you all read that? This is the place that they move to next. And then in their life, they get to this place, which is called Canaan. And this is actually the promised land. This is where they are going to end up. This is the dream. This is what God has for them, all right? So with that setting, let me start with this. Abraham's dad's name's Terah. Let's look at this scripture here. This is the account of Terah's family. Terah was the father of Abram, or Abraham, of Nahor and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, the land of his birth, while his father Terah was still living. One of the greatest tragedies in our human existence is for a parent to outlive their children. And you got to imagine for Terah, this was really, really hard that one of his three children died at this place while he was still alive. Next scripture in Genesis, 
One day, Terah took his son, Abram, his daughter-in-law, Sarai, who becomes Sarah. Her name changes as well. And his grandson, Lot, which was Haran's son. And he moved away from Ur of the Chaldeans. And he's headed to the land of Canaan. But check this out. He stopped and he settled at Har- Har- uh, Haran. He stopped and he settled. He's headed to the promised land. But he stopped and he settled. And then Terah, the, the godfather of this story, if you will, lives for 205 years, and he dies while he's still in Haran. Can I just say a couple things about this that stand out to me? One is where you stop and where you settle in your life is where something's going to die. Listen, you can't, you can't settle for halfway to what God has for you in your life. It's going to take courage. It's going to take some faith. It's going to take some action steps in your life. But if you stop and you settle, you'll never get to it and you'll die there. Another thing that stands out in the story is this dude lived to be 205 years old. And I just go, man, I don't care how many vitamins I'm on. I don't want to live that old. (laughs) For real. One of my fears right now is this. Like when I'm binge watching Netflix, for me, that's like three shows. That's about all I can do. Uh, My fear is that as I try to stand up, like my hip starts to hurt. And I don't know if I'm going to make it. Like to the fridge. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm like, how old am I? Like, what is happening to my body? And I'm thinking, I mean, I'm 48, so those are my fears. You're, you're, if you're young, God bless you. All right. Interesting story that this happens that Terah moves towards the promised land, stops and settles. The thing that confused me as I was rereading this story is that back in Ur, when Terah has his three sons, one of them's name is Haran. And then I realized as they're traveling, they stop at a city named Haran. And I looked this up in the original language, the Hebrew language. I'm like, is that the same word? Was it named after the sun? And it wasn't named after it. There's a really slight variation in the Hebrew language. And they're actually two different things, but they would both be pronounced Haran. And can you imagine being Terah, the father, and as you are traveling, you come to a place that's the name of some of the greatest pain you've been at in your whole life. And you're like, I'm just going to stop. I can't go on anymore. It just reminds me of my past. And man, I'm telling you, at the crossroads of life, anytime you have a crisis, anytime there's a big move, anytime something unexpected happens, what ultimately is going to happen, you're going to be tempted to just go, I just remember all that I've been through and it's too hard. I can't keep going. And it's pretty wild. The, the boy's name, Haran, is a pretty cool name. It means mountain, mountaineer, somebody who can climb the mountains. The city of Haran is interesting because in the Hebrew language, what the city of Haran means, it means parched. It means a place that's desolate. There's not enough water to even sustain life. And that's where they choose to settle. And think about people that you and I know, and maybe it's been us, that where we stop and settle in our life is at a bad place. We're like, I just want to stop and party here for a little while. And then you realize it all dries up and there's not enough to sustain life, but you paid rent and now you owe somebody. Now you're stuck in this spot in your life and it's a parched place. And it's weird how people build their lives around a parched place. Here's what gets even wilder because I geeked out on Wikipedia and other study materials as I'm studying this. And I went and I was like, Haran, this city actually exists today. It's in modern-day Turkey, but they, in the Assyrian language, because it was under Assyrian rule for a while, they put a C on it, so it's called Charan, but the city still exists. And in the Assyrian language, check this out, this word actually doesn't mean parched, it means a road. It's a crossroads city. It represents the decisions and the choices of, well, are we going to keep going or are we going to stop and settle? I was just like blown away at that. I was like, wow. The Lord says to Abraham in Genesis 12, the next part of our story, the Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, which was Haran, leave your relatives and your father's family, go to the land that I will show you. And man, this is the moment where Abraham gets his calling. It's the moment where he gets his dream. He's lived here. He's now 75 years old. And God says, I want you to leave all your comforts, all your family, the place that you know, this parched land, and I just want you to go this way. (laughs) You know what I don't like about God? I mean, I I love you. You, Just I'm making a point. Just go with me. I don't like that God doesn't give us 
a five-year plan. God doesn't lay out all the details. God just goes, hey, you've been living like this. I want you to stop that and move out and go over here and follow me. And you're like, okay, but what do I do for a job? And how do I do this? And where's the meeting at? And how do I get to that? And God goes, hi, I want you to move out of here and I want you to go (laughs) this way. It's like, come on. And it really takes trust to go, (laughs) leave what I know, leave the evil I know for the evil I don't know. And this is the place of faith. That's Abraham's calling. That's why he's the father of our faith. He leaves this place to go do that. It's an incredible thing that God asks of him. This is his calling. And man, I know this about my life and maybe your life too. If You know, some of you, God's put a dream inside of you. Some of you have some songs to write. Some of you have business ideas. Some of you have a dream to open up something that's a civic center to help some kids in the community. Some of you have businesses to launch. And and God places those dreams in our life. But in the pursuit of the dream that God has for you, he will ask you to give up some comforts to go after his calling. And I wish it wasn't that way, but that's the way it is. Like God won't let you have everything you want and all the blessings of God. Like it's a crossroad. You got to choose. I'm going to go after what God has for me. It's the calling of faith. Here's the first kind of big thought maybe that I had as I was getting ready for this. And that's this idea that God is at work in our lives before we arrive. Like God is a God of history. He shows up in our lives (laughs) before we do. And sometimes we forget that, but God's the God of history. He knows the beginning from the end. He can get you through this chapter of your life. Can I tell you that some of you are living in a scene in the Marvel universe of movies that is unending, and you're, you're stuck in a scene, and you think this is all it is. This is how life is going to be. I can't get out of it. Can I tell you, God is bigger than the scene that you're living in right now. He sees the, the beginning and the end of it. He knows what you're going through. Nothing is surprising, God. You hit a crisis moment in your journey, and you're like, God, where are you? And God's going, I've been here. You're late. Like, I got it all worked out. I just need you to kind of go through this, you know. Trust me. I've already made the plans. Like, this is how big God is. Are you tracking with me? Is this helping somebody? Sometimes we've got a a wrong perspective. So Abby plays basketball at Southridge. Go Southridge, sons. And... uh, this family started coming uh, to the games. Austin met them, invited them to church. They started coming, and it's great. And, and uh, the girl has a little sister who's five years old. Her name's Olivia. Olivia is so cute, you guys. She is the cutest. Like, listen, I don't have a five-year-old grandson or granddaughter yet, so I can tell you scientifically this is the cutest five-year-old there is, okay? She's <laughs> cute. And so she would recognize me from church, and then at the basketball games, at the basketball games, she'd come and say hi. She'd be like, hi, Pastor Matt. And I'd be like, hi, Olivia. And so we'd talk, and I'd be like, did you go to work today? She's like, I don't work. And so we'd have these conversations. And so I thought, oh, you know what would be fun is I'm going to take her to the concession stand and buy her a snack because I wanted to buy me a snack too, and it just felt a lot better if I'm treating a, a child. Her hands are so small, I couldn't hold her hand. I, she literally would grab my finger, you know, and she's just like telling me about her day. I drew some, I drew some flowers, you know, <laughs> great. What do you want? I want popcorn and nachos and an Italian soda and one of those long candies. And I, I'm like, Olivia, one thing. So anyway, we have this thing at halftime. So right before halftime, every game, she would come and sit by me and start doing, you know, like this to me. <laughs> I passed her, you know, and so... It was our little thing. It's awesome. Now, the basketball season takes a break when the school takes a break for uh, at the end of December, right before Christmas break. And so we're coming up on the Christmas break. And I remember that Olivia uh, is uh, walking with me. We've got three games left. So we're, the, and we're there. And I, I said, Olivia, I said, Christmas is coming. Are you getting presents? She goes, yes, lots of presents. I said, do you know what you're getting? She goes, no. <laughs> And I said, well, that's awesome. You're pretty excited. She goes, yes. I said, when's your birthday? She goes, it's coming soon. And I said, awesome. I said, do you know what the date is? She goes, no. (laughs) 
And I said, do you know know the month? She goes, "Uh uh-uh. And I said, okay. And she goes, wait. She goes, I know that we have Christmas, and then I go to sleep three times, and then it's my birthday. And so I'm like, oh, that's awesome. So we go back, two more games. Last game on the Friday night, and we're waiting for the girls to come out of the locker room. They come up, and we're saying goodbye to the fams that are there that we know, the, the parents. And I'm like, bye, you guys. I said, Olivia, have a Merry Christmas. Oh, and happy birthday. And her parents look at me confused. And I go, you guys, isn't it her birthday? They said, yeah, March 28th is her birthday. (laughs) And Olivia's just like, you know, like that. Can I just say, we're like Olivia on the journey of life. Like, we're like, God said I'm having a birthday. It's in three days. No, you got decades, baby, of what you got. But we don't, we just think that God is going to do these promises. Sometimes God will give you a glimpse of a promise so that you'll walk in that direction. And we think all, everything good's going to happen. No, you're going to go through some crossroads moments on the way to the promised land. And you got to have enough faith in God to recognize that God has been working in your life before you got there. He's been setting it up. Here's what's interesting about the call of Abraham. When God speaks that first scripture that we showed at the beginning of this message, I don't know if we have it, if we can put that up. I think it's the next slide. Look at that. It is. Then the Lord says to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as a possession. Now check this out. I want you to think with me for a second. If I'm Abraham, I'm confused because the moment that God spoke to me was right here. In a desolate place, God begins to speak to me and says, I want you to get up and I want you to go this direction. Leave this place, leave this family, and I'm going to give you some blessings. And so if I'm Abraham, I'm going, I ain't from Ur. I'm from Haran. Like, this is the other side of the tracks, brother. I'm from here. And God goes, I'm bigger than that. I wasn't working in your life at the moment I called you. I was working in your life when Tara was your daddy and when you were going through this stuff over here and your brother died, I was setting all the pieces of your life up way back here. I called you out of Ur, not out of Haran. Listen, at the moment that you put your faith in Jesus, you think your life began, but God was working stuff behind the scenes for you way back here. Some of you, your family of origin, the things you went through, the suffering that you've endured, the jobs that you had to go through, and all the different relational conflict, you think that's just your past and that you're hoping for a better day. Can I tell you, God's been working in your life to unthread the mess of your life since before you were born. He sees you. He knows your life. Come on, this is some good news right here. I love that in Isaiah... God speaks to the whole nation of Abraham's children. And and God says this in Isaiah. And God says this in Isaiah. He says, for I am God. There is no other. I am God and there's none like me. I declare the end from the beginning. From ancient times till the things not yet done. But I say this, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. This is God's perspective of your life and history in general. He goes, I know everything from before you got here till after you're going to be long gone. Before things that were ancient and before things that I started that I haven't finished yet. And I'm telling you that if I said it, I'm going to make it happen. This is encouraging me. I don't know if this is encouraging you. I want to put this on the screen. I want you to see this, and I want you to capture this. God has the ending of your story worked out. You and I just have to walk it out. Can you put that on the screen? Or we got? No, it's a black screen. That's it. Can you read that? God has the ending of your story worked out. You and I just have to walk it out. Listen, he's been writing your story. Things that you and I are going through, we're going to get through those things. But all of us are at crossroads moments in our life, and we got to decide how we're going to handle that. So let me talk about crossroads for a minute, because I studied crossroads, and it's kind of an interesting topic, because worldwide, in every culture, Christian, non-Christian, they all have a mythology about crossroads. 
Like crossroads is an interesting concept. It always represents in every culture decisions and deception and all these interesting, interesting things. In Greek mythology, there's a goddess called Hecate who is a three-faced woman, three-bodied woman. She stands in the statues with one facing this way. There's one attached to her facing this way and a third one facing this way, like in a triangle. And the mythology is that she comes from the underworld, but she's a mediator that stands between the living uh, on the planet, the humans, and the divine. And she stands at the crossroads, and they would literally put her statue at crossroads. And she would be the one who would decide if she would give travelers safe passage or if she would deceive them into going down a wrong road. And they would, people would bring uh, meals and offerings to her and even kill animals as a sacrifice, hoping to go the right direction in the crossroads of life. It's an interesting thing. There is a story that was written in the 1500s by a German author, and the book was called Faust, F-A-U-S-T. And this idea of Faustian uh, mythology has been this kind of interesting story that a lot of works have been based on the novel Faust. It's been done into um, some movies and things like that in our modern culture, but the basic story of the Faust uh, character is this, that Faust is in love with this young girl. He can't get her to fall in love with him. At one point in the story, he's out in the fields, he's out on a journey, and he comes to a crossroads, and it's interesting that the devil shows up at the crossroads, and the devil it says, I will help you get the girl if you'll give me your soul, and so the Faustian mythology is that if you'll make a deal with the devil, you can get what you want, but it'll cost you. There's an interesting mythology about the crossroads. If you're a music fan, especially rock and roll and blues, there is this story of a, a, a guy who's a guitar player, uh, John, something Johnson, and they say that he disappeared for three months. He comes back, and before that three months, couldn't sell a record. His guitar playing wasn't that good. But he's gone for three months, and he comes back, and he's this incredible guitar player, and his career takes off, and the legend in the music world says that what he did is he was on a crossroads and he meets the devil and says, I will do anything to have musical success and sells his soul for that. And there's songs about that and it's throughout music. Listen, God has a mythology about crossroads. Actually, God has a truth about crossroads. But I will tell you this, make no mistake that whatever you're facing in your life right now, you're at a crossroads. And you got to decide what you're going to do. The Bible in Proverbs chapter 8 says that wisdom stands at the top of the hill on the crossroads and makes her stand. It's all throughout scripture. Look at Jeremiah. This scripture will be on the screen. This is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk in it. Travel its path. And you will find rest for your souls. And then the Bible, which never cuts corners, but always talks about the reality of our human response. Some knucklehead like you or me says, no, that's not the road we want. <laughs> Listen, you know what? We get on the journey of life. We're tempted to settle because of pain. We start to go and come to the crossroads and you're going to have the devil offer you something. But really, he's not offering you something. He's taken something. Then you got the, maybe the Hakati idea where it's like, I don't know which way to go and what do I need to do to go the right direction? And then you have wisdom. You have God himself standing at the crossroads of our lives going, hey, it's really simple. Go down this godly path. Just keep walking straight. Yeah, but Lord, there's like, like, what do I do when I get to this turn? It's really simple. Go down this road. Keep walking straight. It's an ancient path. And if you just keep following it, you're going to get there. Yeah, but Lord, I'm tired and I'm coming from a parched place. How am I going to get water? I want you to walk down this godly path. It's really simple. And uh, listen, can I just tell you that there's always, God always helps us with the crossroads moments in our life, if we'll listen. Terah was headed for the land of Canaan, but he stopped at a city that's named Rhodes, <clears throat> and he settled. He settled. I don't, know, I don't know what it is about our lives, but, man, I'm, again, I'm in my 40s. I, I'm going to say it as often as I can because I'm going to be in my 50s soon. 
But can I just tell you this? The, where fear grips me, don't keep going. This is hard. You should stop. This is as good as it gets. But I'm Matt Mould. I'm going to get back up. You punch me. I'm going to get back up. I'm going to say no. I'm going to keep going down that old simple path. God is going to build his church, and the gates of hell can't stand against it. And God called me to try cities, and there's thousands of people that still need to hear the gospel. And we're going to keep going, and we're going to keep changing things. We're going to keep doing whatever it takes to get the gospel. And I just got something in me that says, no, I want to keep going. But the fear in my life that's real makes me want to stop and settle. Listen, these are the demons I wrestle. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe you go, hey, I, I just, I want to give up on this thing that's important because I, there's so much pain that I don't think I can keep going. I want to just tell you as your pastor today, you got to get up, man. Put a little Vaseline on the eyes, squirt the water in the face, tighten those gloves up, and get in there another round. You don't know how tired the enemy is. You might be tired, but... You might be on the verge of winning. Don't stop. Don't settle. Don't let the fears of the crossroads keep you from the destiny that God has for you. I wrote it out like this. Fear won't always cause you to go backwards, but it will surely keep you from moving forward. And you know what will happen in your life is you go, well, I'm not going to go back to like my party lifestyle. I'm not going to go all the way back here because I, I made it here. I started going to church, so I'm not going to just like... I'm not going to, like, forget everything and just, like, abandon that. But you know what? God didn't call you to just go to church. He wants you to get baptized. He wants you to start giving money. He wants you to start serving. He wants you to start forgiving all those people. He wants you to keep going into the thing. He doesn't want you to settle for where your Christian faith is at today. And you go, oh, well, I'm not going backwards. That's not the point. The point is that fear will cause you just to stop and go, well, I'm, I'm good enough. I'm going to heaven, I, you know, whatever. Are you hearing me today? I hope, I hope this is helping you. John Acuff, who's an author and a business leader, on Instagram this week, he said, I wrote my first book at 34, started my first business at 40. Fear tells you that you can only take risks in your 20s. That's garbage. And I want to say to John Acuff, that's right. Listen, it doesn't matter how old you are, where you're at in the journey of your life. If God has called you, if he's put a dream for a promised land and he's asked you to give something up, he will get you there. He's the God that sees, the God that can carry you, but you and I got to walk in the path. Uh, some of you know who Bear Grylls is from the survival show uh, or the fake survival show or whatever, the survival <laughs> show. But he did have a great quote. He said, survival is not about being fearless. It's about making a decision, getting on and doing it because I want to see my kids again or whatever the reason might be. What he says in uh, some of his interviews is he says the reason people die out in the wilderness is not because they make the wrong decision, but because they make no decision and they freeze and that kills them. And the reality is in our life is that that's what it looks like when we stop and say, we go, I'm not going to make any more good calls. I'm not going to take any more risks. This is good enough. No, you're in a parched place. Man, your soul's thirsty for some more life. You need a drink of water. You need some Holy Spirit pour out on your soul. You need God to help you. I'm telling you, the way to get there, it's real simple. I'd like you to just keep walking down this path, the godly way. It's really simple. Just go straight. Like God is just simple like that. Here's the last thought I have. Is anybody getting any good out of this today? Is this helping you? Uh, the, um, our band, our band can kind of get ready. The band is really good looking. Please don't look at them. Keep your attention on me. Here's the last thought I want to give you is this, that carrying on at the crossroads impacts generations. It's not just for you. I just finished a really, really good book called The Third Option. It's about racism in America, and I'm actually going to recommend everybody to read that in a sermon series coming up, and I'm going to make homework assignment for everybody here, Pastor Miles McPherson's message, because it's powerful. But one of the points in his book that he talks about is he says that different cultures have different responses to how they view the world. And he said in uh, African uh, cultures, in Latino cultures, in Asian cultures, they tend to view their story as part of a larger group story. 
And that's why people kind of connect on those levels. And he said that in European and, and American whiteness, you know, what we tend to do is have an individual view of culture and our story that it's just my life and my story. And he says we need to learn from each other's cultures. And here's what I want you to see is that a lot of times we look at our lives like I got a calling. I moved from here. God called me, so I'm going after my promises. No, 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 no. I want you to see something bigger than that, that God arranged the family that you were born into. He speaks his call into your life, and he's calling you to the promised land, but it's not just for you. It's for a people that are going to come after you. The decisions that you make at the crossroads for certain have an impact on the generation that's coming after you. They are watching and learning, and what you do, good or bad, I'm telling you, it's not just for you. It's for those that are coming after you. And we got to take the crossroads serious in this way. Abraham didn't settle. He continued on. He believed in the dream that God had spoken to him about a land and about a family. He promised to God for his future. So... Uh, what happens in the story kind of relates to me. That's why I'm emotional right now. Uh, but what I love is Abraham's 75 when he gets the call. He starts going out here. He gets to be 100 when he has a baby. Honestly, like, that's creepy, like BuzzFeed. You know what I mean? Like weird. Okay, so that happens. He has a son named Isaac, kind of a miracle story. It's the beginning of God's promise to him. But then Isaac has a son named Jacob. If you read through the, the, the Bible, you will eventually come across this phrase where God is speaking and he'll say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob's the grandson. And what I believe happens is that because Abraham takes a step at the crossroads to continue going, he doesn't settle, but he moves towards the promises of God. What he does in that moment is so significant that it opens up the doorways of blessings for his son and his grandson. I want you to see this. I read this and it blew my mind. This is now Jacob's story, the grandson of Abraham. Meanwhile, Jacob fled or left Beersheba and he traveled towards Haran. He's going now on his own journey back towards this place. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp. He stopped there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head on and laid down to sleep. I call that Motel 1. Like, it's not even Motel 6. Like, here's a rock, you know. As he slept, he dreamed. He's out in the middle of the desert. As he falls asleep in a desolate place, God gives him a dream. God begins to call Jacob in the same place that God spoke to Abraham. It's at this place that he has a vision. He wakes up, and if you were to read the rest of that chapter, Jacob goes, I had no clue, but God was in this place. I couldn't sense it. I couldn't see it. I just knew I had to keep walking. But, man, I had this moment, and I'm like, God's here. I'm telling you, if you'll keep walking in the way you should go, you're going to have a Jacob moment. God will re-speak dreams to you about what he'll do for you. It's an incredible thing. The reason it's personal, my mom and dad moved out here, most of you know that, last summer with my sister and brother-in-law. And my dad, uh, when he grew up, got in a lot of trouble as a kid. He was a fighter, and uh, he had an abusive father, an abusive grandfather, and it's really a horrible life, a lot of anger. My dad decided somehow it was God working before my dad even knew God. My dad decided, I want to have a great family. I want to be a great dad. I don't want to hit my kids. I want to just, like, I want this to be different. Where do you think that came from? It's because God is the God of our history, right? So in his journey... He ends up meeting my mom, starts going to church because of my mom. I don't recommend that strategy, but you know, it worked. <laughs> Gives his life to Jesus, marries my mom, doesn't know what to do to be a good dad, so he reads books. He was like the greatest dad ever. He's alive still. He's, he is <laughs> the greatest dad ever. God rest his soul, you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding.
I'm telling you this, that it was really hard for my dad. It's probably still hard for my dad. Because he's like, why is it so hard? I still have guilt. I don't know if I'm doing it right. Don't know if I did enough. I wanted to give my kids more and all that. But that's what all pioneers do is when you're cutting the path, it's hard and you're getting scraped up. But then the path behind you is really easy for the people coming. I'm telling you, it's because of my dad that I can dream. You've got to see this today, that at the crossroads of your life, it's not just your story. It's that people are watching. You might not have kids. You got neighbors. You got friends. You got coworkers. And they might make fun of you, but you might be the only vision of what following Jesus looks like. And they need you to not stop and settle, to not give in to the fears and go, this is just good enough. I can't do it. No, you got to get moving. You got to do this because it matters. It matters for people. Here's where we'll end today with this scripture. This is a, a great story. You know, Abraham goes to all these different places, and this is the story I want to end with. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba, and there he worshiped the Lord, the eternal God. And Abraham lived there as a foreigner for a while. Now, check this out. Everywhere, if you read the whole story of Abraham, what happens is everywhere he goes, he has a crossroads moment, he'll set up a stone. He'll make an altar. He'll plant a tree. He's doing memorials so that he doesn't forget the good things God's done in his life. And he's telling a story to the next generation. At this moment, I imagine it had to happen something like this. God brings him through this moment, and he goes, this is significant. We're going to plant a tree. Eventually, that tree is going to become another tree in a forest, but we're going to do this. And I want everybody here to know something. What God does is so good. He's the eternal God. Don't you forget it. So as the story got told down to the grandkids, great-grandkids and all that, it finally gets written down in Scripture. They remember that Abraham comes to this place and worshiped God and called him the eternal God. It wasn't God generic. It wasn't the God that spoke to me. He uses brand new terminology. He goes, this moment in my life, I can tell you for sure, God is the eternal God. Here's why I love this and why this is significant. We live in temporary circumstances of what we're going through. God is living in eternity. And listen, this is God to build your faith, that God sees way beyond the moments that you're in, and he sees the scope of history, and he is the eternal God. It's so good. That's the best perspective we can have about our life, is that our God is the eternal God. I want to pray with you. I want you to close your eyes. I believe that God is speaking by his Holy Spirit to people in venue two and people in this venue here. And there's something in you that is going, I want to move forward. I'm stuck. I feel like I'm got to settle. I just want to give up. I don't even know how to go anymore. I'm telling you that you came to church on the right Sunday. God sent me here to preach this message on this day to speak like a road sign on the journey of your life. You're not to stop. You are not to settle. Like God is calling for you. God, I just, I thank you that you're here. Whatever you're doing beyond what we can even see, Lord, I pray that your work would just happen. I pray in, in lives that are in this building that everyone that's hearing from you would have a yes, I will take that step, God, inside their soul. There would be a, I'm gonna get up again. I'm gonna try again. I'm not gonna quit I'm going to keep moving. God, let it, this be an action moment in the history of their lives. Let this be like a Sunday where we plant a tamarisk tree. Say, I'm not going to forget this moment. God's bigger than what I'm going through. He's eternal. Lord, we just stand against any spirit of fear in Jesus' name, and we say we will not be intimidated. We will go forward in our life. 
Thank you, Lord. You're so good to us.